Thank you. Okay, my name is Jung Hye Yang. Uh, I'm retired from Sungkyunkwan University. I'm a sociologist. I'm honored to uh, moderate this session. This is the first session of uh, this conference, and uh, we'll have uh, three uh, presentations. Um, the way uh, I'm moderating this session is, first, we uh, listen to a presentation for 25 minutes, okay? And then we'll have a, discuss, a discussion from designated discussant, uh, roughly between five or seven minutes. And then we'll uh, have questions and comments from floor for about 10 minutes. So each uh, presentation I allotted about 40 minutes, so total two hours for this session. Our first uh, speaker is Professor Erwin So. Uh, he is my old friend. We uh, have uh, researched together for about five or six years, and uh, he's expert in, uh, I think, uh, development and change. But now he's uh, doing some research on uh, cap uh, China, capitalism in China, and uh, he uh, published recently a book on uh, Chinese capitalism. Today, he's going to present uh, part of his uh, research. It is, I think it is very interesting. Uh, I read already his paper, and uh, I found very interesting. And um, he um, identified Chinese capitalism as state neoliberal capitalism. And uh, we're going to uh, find out what uh, he meant by uh, State New Liberal Capitalism. Okay, please. So this paper is a co-author with Cindy, Yu, Cindy Chu from Hong Kong Baptist College, Hong Kong Baptist University. So our aim is to, using a competitive framework, so identify certain elements of a new variety of capitalism, what we call state neoliberalism. So the paper will start first with the comparative framework. So we'll compare China with the developmental state in the South, with the neoliberalism capitalism in the West, and the neoliberalism reforms in Eastern Europe. And then we'll try to explain this, what, what are the explain the, the ceaseless drive to capital accumulations because we define capitalism as having this kind of a drive of capital accumulations. And then we try to distinguish several characteristics of state neoliberalism. At the end, if I have time, we'll talk about the kind of the prospects of this kind of uh, Chinese road to capitalism. So first, let us look at the comparative framework. So compare with the, the, the developmental state, China have a strong state machinery. It has high autonomous and the capacity to carry out reforms. In addition, the Chinese state actively intervene in the economy through debt, debt financing and infrastructure projects. Also, the state mobilized the ideology of nationalism. So development, development capitalism is seen as a national project to make the nation strong and powerful, and wealthy and powerful. Similar to other developmental states, China also adopt authoritarian policies to discipline labor, to de deactivate civil society, in order to attract foreign investments. Also, China received an influx of capital investments during its initial period. Of course, uh, in, in the authoritarian state like in Korea, Taiwan, the infrastructure, infrastructure of capital is provided by the US during the Cold War. Of course, US will not provide capital for China's development. So the influx of capital, mostly from the overseas Chinese, from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from Singapore, and Southeast Asia. 
So compare the China with the Western capitalism. China started reforms in the late, late 70s. Late 70s is a high tide of neoliberalism. So neoliberalism, in David Harvey's term, was a project, a class project, in which the capitalist class to fight back against the taxes, high taxes and rigid regulations in the social democratic welfare state. So in the 70s, neoliberalism is almost irresistible in the third world. When China adopted in the late 70s, its neoliberalism emerged under totally different historical context. Because China is a state socialist society. China just went through a, a devastating cultural revolution. The aim is to kind of suppress the market and destroy the capitalist class. So the market was almost non-existent in China, and the capitalist class was very really weak. China society, Chinese society was still hostile to capitalism in the late 70s. So the question is, which agency would help China to move into capitalism? So as a result, the Communist Party state, not the capitalist, was the dominant agent to carry out the neoliberal market reforms in China in the, 19, in the late 1980s, in the 1970s, when China ran into kind of economic stagnations. So the party state need to do kind of a, the things that you don't need to do in the capitalist society. So the, the Chinese party state needed to reinvent the market, to liberate the market from the planned economy, and to reintegrate China into the capitalist world systems. Because China before that was a closed economy, totally isolated from the capitalist world economy. No import, no export. So the party have to play a very active role to promote capital accumulations. So the party carry out the, this kind of following neoliberal market reforms. First, you have the collectivizations. So to kind of uh, to eliminate the communal systems. Instead, to change the unit of productions from the communal to the household. So there's a kind of household responsibility systems. The household re is responsible, not the state. And then carry out politicizations. So after losing this kind of collective benefits in the commune, the peasants have to pay high, high expensive fees for medical, for health care, for education expenses. And suddenly the peasants find kind of a, they're kind of too much, too many population in the countryside. So China in the 70s, late 70s started the largest wave of migration in the world. The peasants move in the cities. So over 100 million moved in cities for, to form a kind of a, a large reserve labor pool. And this laid the foundations of industrialization. And then you have a marketization policy. For example, like the, the, the invention of a new, something called the labor market. So in the 70s and 80s, you can labor become kind of a, can be sold, can be bought at the market. So after the, the formation of the labor market, the corporations can respond to the market demand. So if the corporation is not doing well, the corporation can lay off the, the workers. And then they have a kind of open up policies. So China started the kind of four special economic zones, the 14 coastal cities and three delta areas to, 
to attract foreign investments. So all these openings occur in the coastal areas. So they started a kind of uneven development. There's kind of the differences between the coastal areas and the hinterland. But China's post-socialist experience is different from Eastern Europe in two sense. The first is the goal is different. In Eastern Europe, the reforms, like the kind of mass privatizations, the aim is to dismantle communism, to strip the communists of power and privileges. But in China, the reforms is just the opposite. In China, the reforms, the market reforms, were aimed to kind of uh, restore the power of the Communist Party so, to, so that they can stay in power for a longer time. The second difference is the speed. In Eastern Europe, the market reforms were carried out as soon as possible. So-called big band, you can do it in one big band, or the shock therapies. But in China, the reforms it's always a gradual, adaptive process without a blueprint, a try and error. So the Chinese are pragmatic. It works, it continues. If it doesn't work, it slows down or it reverses. So there's frequent mid-course corrections and reversals. So you can see kind of one step forward and two step backwards, or two step forwards, one step backwards. So that's why the reforms are always contradictory, ambiguous. There's no clear-cut directions where it's moving. The reforms are incomplete. It's still in process or transition. Even now, it's doing like this. So the question is, if this is the case, then what explain the ceaseless drive of capitalism in China? So why the Chinese enterprise suddenly become so enthusiastic in capital accumulations? So we argue that all this began with the change of the reward system in the state. So in the, in the 19, late 1970s, the party used the economic development, spe specifically the rate of economic growth so whether you have 10% growth or 5% growth, or this percentage growth will determine the compensation of the officials, the promotions of officials. And the second point is, this kind of ceaseless drive of accumulations is not happening at the top, at the central party state level, but happen at the local level. It's the local officials that are most eager to promote capital accumulations. So in the 80s, beginning in the 80s, large number of the central administrative enterprises is transferred to the local level. And the local officials are encouraged to make new ways to promote economic development. And they are told that now they have a full authority to do whatever thing they want to promote economic development. So this is administrative decentralization. The power to make decisions now kind of uh, shifted to the local level. In addition, the local levels were assured that if the project is successful, if economic development is working. The local level can keep the, in, the increased revenue at the local level and use it for local development. So the, the use of the fiscal resources now kind of shift back to the local level. So these are the two decentralizations the administrative decentralizations and fiscal decentralizations. But there's a catch. So if the local projects lose money, the central government will not 
bail them out. So the local actors are forced to face the market competitions. So this is like a kind of imposing the hard budget constraints on the, on the local structure. So once this is in place, it starts a whole new dynamics. So the dynamics is the locals could observe they are falling behind. For example, like a, in the university ranking, so is falling behind Yangtze. So this started kind of a, every local actor suddenly become very active to copy the successful front runners. So no one want to left behind. So everyone tried to kind of compete to rise at the top. <coughs> so in the Chinese literature, it, it, there's a lot of study on the kind of the hectic market competitions. So these market competitions among the local firms, the local government, we identified this the fundamental source of China's dynamics of capital accumulations. So even though China have no formal institution of property rights in the 80s and 90s, the local actors are still very active to promote capital accumulations because of the kind of institutional change. So from the above analysis, we think kind of a, what are the best way to characterize China so we kind of think about a new term called state neoliberalism. So of course, this is just coming from ideas. So it's still a kind of a, a, a concept in, in process. So your comments on this is highly welcome. In state neoliberalism, the first characteristic is the Communist Party is a dominant agency to promote neoliberal reforms not the capitalist. Even the state is a dominant agency, but it's a local state, not the central state. And it's this kind of decentralization policies that arouse a set of local initiative. So the, it's a fiscal decentralization that provide incentives for the local actors to capture the market opportunity because they can actually can, they can get something in the pocket. So if, they get, if, they, if the project is successful, there'll be more resources. In addition, there's administrative decentralization and intense interlocal competitions that explain there's a variety of path of development at the subnational level. In the literature, talk about the Guangdong level, that kind of open to the foreign investments, or the one Zhao model, which rely on the kind of private investments, and the Sunan model based on the kind of the, the local state. So it's the decentralization in the local state that provide, explain a variety of paths at the local level. This kind of split between the center and the local, what are called kind of by third, by third, I shouldn't use the word, kind of split, the state is split in the central and local area. And explain kind of a, why the Communist Party is in full control, despite there's a lot of protests at the local areas. So in the, in the past two decades, we have a lot of strikes and the peasant protest but then it's because of this kind of split between the central and local area. Because the central area, the central government is still in moral high grounds. No one blame the central communist party. All the blames is trust the local government. The local officials is corrupted. The local officials make bad decisions in economic development that waste all the resources. So this central and local differentiation is very important because the state is dominant and this pattern shape lead to a different 
entrepreneurship in China. So the require the, the private capitalists to develop a personalized clientele relationship with the local state managers. So you cannot do business in China if you don't have any kind of backing from the local officials. Because first, it helped to protect the business from the predatory practice of the local tax bureau and the lo and labor bureau. So without somebody behind you to protect you, these two bureaus will come to your enterprise all the time. And also you need the backing in order to get access to resource. For example, get a bank loans or kind of get a permit to venture in the new industry. So all this require the support of local state managers. McNally actually called it a different name called Guanxi Capitalism when he described this kind of relationship. There's a political network between the private entrepreneurs and the state local officials. So this kind of Guanxi relationship, the bridge, the logic between a free willing private capital accumulations and the state, the authoritarian control in a state dominated economy. So our concept of state capitalism is to try to capture this kind of relationships. So, so we argue that kind of a, even though this kind of state capitalism works over the past 30 years and moved China from a poor backward countries to <laughs> the economic powers of the world. So have an economic growth, 10 minutes, no, 10% growth in average over the past 30 years. However, doing well in the past 30 years doesn't mean China will do well in the future. Because in the past, China is going through an initial phase called catching up. Catching up is much more easy. But now, China reached a critical turning point. So China is in the directions moving to a new phase, a more mature phase, what they call the rising power. So a challenge will be different. So the first challenge is China have trouble to invent, to maintain a kind of hyper growth rate. So as the economy matures, as they exhaust all the potential of export-led industrializations based on labor intensive industries. Moreover, right now, we have global economic recessions, the falling of exports, and also China kind of using up its kind of resources, and its environment is reaching the point of kind of breaking down, and China's population is aging, so this is kind of a first time in, in China over the past 40 years, they have something called labor shortage. No one can imagine that China, the rural countries that cannot support enough labor for the urban factories. So given all these factors, so China is a real challenge for China to maintain kind of like a even 7% growth rate. The second challenge is kind of a, a challenge of hegemonic struggles. To develop capitalism, you need raw material, you need market, you need labor, you need capital. But all this, you have to go outside the country to get it. So this search for raw materials globally bring China into conflict with major world powers. So especially among China's neighbors, Japan, Vietnam, the Philippines. So all these conflicts have been intense, intensified over time as China become more global oriented. So all these conflict will become more acute. So right now in the US, there's always kind of a, the, 
researchers, kind of uh, policy advisors, and kind of explore measures how to prevent or slow down the rise of China. The last challenge we talk about kind of uh, the changing class structure. When capitalism develop, expand very fast, they are bound to be kind of expansion of the capitalist class and the expansion of the middle class. So all these classes will try to seek more power and influence on the state decision making. Thus this class is going to challenge the power of the Communist Party. At the same time, the, kind of the workers and peasants become more restless. The party is under increasing pressure to kind of a political restructuring, democratic reforms or power sharing in order to solve this kind of intense political conflict. So China now is entering a period of tur turbulence coincide with the, with, the, with the world systems. So it's hard to predict whether China could successful move to the mature phase. So now, now is a critical moment. So exactly how the Communist Party handle these current challenges will play a very significant role in determining the historical fate of China's in the near future. So all these uncertainties, but one thing that's sure is if the rise of China, the world become more chaos. So we expect there will be more fighting kind of conflict in the world over the next kind of a two or at least half a century, kind of in the 21st century. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Erwin. Um, you spend a little more time. <laughs> well, we have uh, a designated uh, discussant, Professor Chu Yong Zhong. Uh, she is uh, Professor of Political Science, Korea University, Seoul, Korea. Her major field of interest is comparative political economy with expertise in China. And we'll first uh, hear about uh, her discussion. Uh, discussion and then uh, comments and uh, questions will be open to the floor. Please. Okay, um, thank you, Professor Yang. Um, again, I'm Jung Juan at Korea University. Uh, I'm really interested in this topic, and it's such a fascinating question, right? Um, Chinese market economy, what is it? Um, how to characterize it? So, is it completely new? Is this simply a hybrid? Or just a variance of what we already know? Right? This question is important because if it's uh, something really new, then we need a new concept, terminology, uh, and category right, um, that we have ignored uh, so far. So I'm, I'm fascinated by this uh, topic and really um, uh, enjoyed reading the paper. Um, however, I guess um, when I discuss the paper, it's the best to provide some um, criticism. So I will try to focus on um, the limitations of, of the, the discussion in the paper so that I can be uh, helpful um, a little bit. Um, so the authors, Professor Sohan Chu, um, label China's capitalism as state neoliberalism. So in other words, Chinese capitalism is state neoliberal capitalism. Okay, um, I have four sets of comments here. Um, first of all, um, it's given that China, Chinese economy is capitalism, um, but is it? Um, maybe it is, um, and it seems that the authors kind of assume that because the Chinese economic system is even more ruthless um, than um, the market uh, systems we know of and um, allows individual greed. Um, yes, that's true maybe, but does that automatically mean that Chinese economic system is capitalist? 
this question is important, I think, uh, because um, it's a question of how to define capitalism. Should we define capitalism based on the greed, the freedom given to individuals, um, ideology, goal of the state, or institution? If isn't this institution, should we focus on property right, price system, free market, um, the level of state intervention? Maybe um, we don't have enough time to discuss that, but that's important because that kind of provides us the standard or conceptual dimension um, that we should use to define capitalism. Then we will be able to apply such um, conceptual standard to discuss um, whether China is truly neoliberal or not, or capitalist or not. So that's the starting point. And the second set of um, comments is about um, Professor Sa's comparison between the Chinese system and the developmental state, mostly East Asian developmental state, I guess. Um, he discusses lots of different similarities between East Asian developmental states and the Chinese state, and say mostly Chinese state is strong, autonomous, and not captured by vested economic interest, mostly due to weak private sector, yes, and um, there is high level of state's economic intervention. Okay, that's true. But when we discuss the concept of developmental state, and strong autonomous state, number one, we focus on uh, autonomous bureaucracy, which is free from the whim of politicians, right? In the case of China, that's not really true. And in terms of the level of technocratic expertise, well, maybe Chinese bureaucracy is not equally comparable to Japanese or Korean technocrats, which is a minor point, actually. Um, not captured by vested economic interest, maybe not captured by private economic interest, less so, but there is this highly vested, the SOE is state-owned enterprises with highly vested interest, and state is captured truly by uh, the SOEs. So in this case, you could argue that SOEs are part of the state, but at the same time, this shows us the needs to disaggregate the concept of the state. So in other words, a part of the state is captured by another part of the state, which might intervene the autonomy of one part of the state, which is the bureaucracy, which should be autonomous. So Chinese state, of course, is autonomous when it comes to suppressive, coercive power, but when it comes to other autonomy, maybe, maybe not. And in terms of state's economic intervention, um, the authors mentioned Jin Oi's local state corporatism. Um, that is very similar to the characteristics of um, developmental states in East Asia. But at the same time, there is a key difference that at the national level, Chinese so-called developmental state would, would lack coordination power or clear coherent goal that the Japanese and Korean developmental states had. So uh, even though um, authors focus on the similarities, I actually find more differences there. But I don't mean to say that they are not developmental states at all. That's a, a, that more discussion is necessary. But I'm simply saying there might be more differences um, there. And we need to have a more nuanced discussion. The problem is, based on the similarities, the authors discuss differences, which must be the most important part here. Um, significantly different, the authors say, from East Asian developmental state, because the Chinese developmental states, state has exhibited a strong tendency toward neoliberalism. Um, and there is no further explanation there. So I'm really curious. So how different is the Chinese state from East Asian developmental state. And if the key difference is the pursuit of neoliberalism, then Korea has pursued, pursued neoliberalism as well. How, why can't neoliberalism coexist with developmental state? If socialism can coexist with developmental, uh, the neoliberalism, um, certainly uh, developmental state can, I think. So um, the, the point, here would be what is the key difference of the Chinese 
capitalism or state, interventionist state, from the East Asian interventionist states? And are they different enough to require a separate concept? That will be the question. Um, okay, third, oh my god. <laughs> I have a, a long list to go. Third set of questions. Um, the difference between neoliberalism in the West and neoliberalism in China. Neoliberalism is defined here in the paper as an ideology that seeks to confine state role to that of expanding markets. State versus market, okay. Um, this is to begin with too wide a web. Um, and at the same time, I wonder why the authors don't really um, rely on the, the well-developed literature on diversities of capitalism because um, when we define difference between liberal and non-liberal capitalism, um, the key difference is the institutional differences um, and liberal capitalism, market coordination, um, stock market-based system versus non-liberal capitalism, non-market coordination, bank-based system. Based on the widely accepted definition, China definitely seems to be non-liberal capitalism. Then why do we define China as a neoliberal? Um, there is a question there. Um, plus, to uh, describe China as neoliberal um, is as, for example, the state capacity has been weakened. But the evidence for that is fiscal decentralization. Uh, first of all, fiscal decentralization was pursued in the early 1980s. Um, in 1994, recentralization has, has, has happened. So it's a little bit outdated. Plus, even if there is fiscal decentralization, that's within the state. So the moving power or capacity from the center to the local level doesn't mean the weakening of state capacity. So I'm not quite sure, really, uh, the state capacity in China has decreased. And if fiscal decentralization has happened, indeed, and central state power has weakened, is that neoliberal at all? Um, so what, in the end, is the difference uh, of Chinese neoliberalism from the Western neoliberal capitalism. Simply the fact that it's state-led, um, more specifically a party state-led. Um, it's ironic, yes, the state playing a key role, but at the same time pursuing very market-friendly, so-called neoliberal policies. But that irony was already pointed out long time ago in the 60s and 70s, looking at East Asian cases. And uh, many scholars has emphasized that the state can be uh, an engine of capitalist economic development, and the state and market are not in a zero-sum game. So if that intuition has been known to us for decades, what is the new intuition China is providing to us? So I will wrap up um, the fourth set of questions. The final um, the question will be then, then what is really the Chinese state neoliberalism? Uh, between um, page number 14 to 19, um, the authors uh, emphasize many key characteristics, decentralization, gradualism, um, socialism, um, personalized relation, state business relationship. Problem is, these are the characteristics of the Chinese economy, yes, but that they are not the defining characteristics um, that is enough to call China as state neoliberal capitalism. And um, when I read this paper, um, I'm persuaded that China is a, indeed capitalist and the state plays an important role. But the final message I get is China is simply capitalist, where the state plays an important interventionist role. Then why not call China a state-led capitalist economy or the existing terms such as state capitalist, but use a new term, uh, neoliberal capitalism? So that will be my final question. Thank you. Um, since we have a limited time, <laughs> Uh, we have just a couple of uh, questions or comments from the floor, and then we'll have an answer from uh, Professor So. Okay. Uh, Michael, Please identify yourself. Michael Dostak, Graduate School of Public Administration. Um, I try to keep it very short.
short, but it connects to what has just been said. Uh, you, it might be an artifact of your use of the English language, uh, but you said uh, the, the classes in China are capitalists, middle class, uh, workers and peasants. And then you said the Chinese Communist Party uh, needs to engage in power sharing with other classes. Uh, so my question is, are there four classes in China or five classes? Is the Chinese Communist Party another social class? Does it integrate the four other social classes? Does it only integrate one or two of these four? Perhaps you could be more explicit in how you see the, the political agency of the Communist Party in this context. Thank you. Just one more. Just one. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Tobias Ten Brink. Um, uh, I have uh, two questions. The first, and this is, I think, the largest, concerns the term neoliberalism and to, to use that term in order to understand China. First of all, I, I think it is a good idea to not just use the old formula of state capitalism, period, because I think this term normally is used, say, by authors in The Economist, to take an example of this famous liberal journal, and which, which has a notion of state capitalism that pretty much simplifies what, what is going on there. It, 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 it simply affirms there's a strong state and he, he keeps the economy growing, something like that. So very much overemphasizing the central state, for instance, and its power. So the, the idea to, 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 to look for new terms and for new notions, I think, is a good one. And I also very much agree with what you describe and what uh, I think also, I, I, I think I also would uh, subscribe to the kind of normative framework that, you're, that, that stands behind what you're saying. But I, I also doubt that the term neoliberalism is really useful because, I mean, did, did, maybe you should just tell us a little more about how you conceptualize this. Because how I read it, at least when I look at the textbook explanation for that, China does look pretty much different from what is assumed to be neoliberal, right? So you look at the corporate governance system. Do, do they aim for full privatization in some sectors? Yes, in others, no, yeah? Maybe we could rather argue the Chinese government has a kind of pro-indigenous business orientation. This is not necessarily a pro-market orientation, right? So, because many, many businesses in several sectors don't, don't have too much market, right? So there, there is competition. But this is not like the neoliberal idea of free markets, right? So maybe there's some room for improvement in that respect. And the other question goes uh, back to the formulation that China is an export-led economy. And I think we also have to go beyond this assumption. Um, in the 2000s, at least, Chinese domestic industrial firms sell, on the average, three to four times more goods on the domestic markets. Right? So this means like, if you, if you look at the levels, 25 to 30, 25 percent roughly in the 2000s. This is for me, is not, 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 not necessarily an export-led economy. Exports are very important, right? But there's also a kind of tendency in the discussion, which is very much dominated by Western discussion about China and what they are for a long time, where thinking is different. Uh, is, uh, sorry, for a long time thought is important, is Chinese exports, yeah? But, this, I think, has changed. And by the way, this, is, this, this strong domestic market uh, already existed long before the Chinese government talked about rebalancing the economy. Yeah. Okay. I think there are many uh, questions and comments from other participants, but uh, I'm sorry I should limit you know, the question because we have uh, already over time. Okay, you give some answer, just five minutes maximum, or three minutes. So all the questions are well taken because our aim is to capture something that kind of a, is highly contradictory, is highly ambiguous, and the phenomenon is still changing. So that's why I invent a term state neoliberalism. But obviously, as the discussion point out, kind of a, you can always pick certain terms, kind of a, but then my, my question is, then how, how would you characterize China? 
we characterize China as a capitalism or kind of state capitalism. So you say you use, can use some definitions like a kind of a kind of a, a laundry list, kind of a, like a property rights, kind of like a market freedom, or kind of de democracy. You can always kind of divide certain some some criteria, but then you you missed the kind of ambiguity and the contradictories of the Chinese formations. So this is what we, we try to capture. So obviously all the questions are valid, but then how to work out a whole new kind of a conceptual framework to capture China's development. China is not an ordinary capitalism. China is it's unique in the sense that kind of it's the only third world country that kind of can rise up so fast in 30 years, become a world power. So obviously the developmental state concept would help, but then of course you can say that uh, always say that uh, China is not a developmental state. Chinese officials are corrupted, their incompetents make a lot, a lot of mistakes. But then you miss the point, kind of how you explain all this kind of a success of China over the past 30 years. So maybe I think, I think we should, at the beginning of the paper, define what it means by capitalism. So we haven't spelled out clearly. So my idea is kind of a, like a capitalism, it distinguished by the kind of a, the drive of ceaseless capital accumulations. So this become a norms. So kind of a, this kind of a, she talk about kind of a like culture, the, this kind of culture almost kind of diffused into the, everybody in society. So China now kind of a, everybody want to make money, kind of a, want to kind of a criminal profit. And this become the only criteria to judge a person, to judge the performance of a, a, a unit or organizations. And this, my, our paper is try to kind of a, explain how this ceaseless drive of capitalism arose under this kind of a strong state. So how could it be possible? So, okay. Yeah.